You see it now? No. <clears throat> yeah. Right now, yes. Okay, so this is an autoimmune <clears throat> disorder. Uh, the characteristic is there is severe muscle weakness. The pattern, though, is not like it is in uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome, where the weakness starts from the feet going up. This one, the pattern is from the top going down. So the patient here, the most of the characteristics start from the eye. <clears throat> eye can going down the bulbar muscles, those affecting the muscles involved in speech, chewing, smiling, swallowing. So those are the first and then uh, gradually it will go down and uh, some patients will have some weakness in the diaphragm, although that's not very um, common. Okay, but it, it can potentially also affect breathing once it hits the, the diaphragm. So how do you get it? <clears throat> so this is an acquired autoimmune disease. So let's explain how you get it. Since it's autoimmune, do we know the exact reason? Hello? No, you don't know. No, so it's uh, it's unknown. We don't know how we get it. Uh, where is my keyboard? My whiteboard. Can you see the whiteboard? Yes. 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 Okay, so let's say this is the end of one <coughs> synapse and this is the beginning of another. Okay, so this is at the neuromuscular junction. So we have, uh, in order for muscle, so this is inside the muscle. Okay, these are, of course, uh, enlarged drawings. So let's say this is the muscle. And so from one muscle section to the next, so we have nerves, right? So nerves are dependent on nerve stimulation. Without nerve stimulation, muscles are useless. That's why that explains why we become paralyzed when we have spinal cord injury. So unlike cardiac muscles, wherein they generate their own uh, action potential, meaning you don't need nerve stimulation to make the heart work, right? They work independently. No need for the brain, no need for anything else. The, the, the heart can function on its own. Not so for skeletal muscles. For muscles to function and move, they need nerve stimulation. So therefore, no nerve stimulation, no movement. So for movement to be possible, we need acetylcholine. <clears throat> So let's just call it ACH. Um, so we have acetylcholine being, it's a neurotransmitter, correct? So we have acetylcholine mo uh, passed on from one uh, neuron to the next neuron. So they're responsible for muscle contraction. And then we need also dopamine in order to control the muscle contraction. But um, myasthenia gravis has nothing to do with dopamine. Um, dopamine will be a <clears throat> Parkinson's problem. So um, I'm just mentioning this, uh, you know, just for uh, the sake of um, physiology review. So we have dopamine in order to control muscle movement. And we have acetylcholine, another neurotransmitter responsible for simply making muscles contract. So uh, at the junction, though, as they are passed on from one, one, one neuron to the next neuron, 
uh, in order for it to be received on the next neuron, there are acetylcholine receptor sites or binding sites. Okay. Meaning there should be enough receptor binding sites for the number of acetylcholine being passed from one neuron to the next. So the problem in myasthenia gravis is, again, we don't know exactly how this happens because it's autoimmune. We develop antibodies against these receptor sites here. Not all of them are destroyed though. However, because you have enough antibodies to destroy them, so you will not have enough acetylcholine receptor sites. So the ACH receptor sites are damaged now. So you have less acetylcholine receptor sites compared to the number of acetylcholine that is being passed. So therefore, will the muscle movement be continuous? No. No, because no. it's like a bottleneck, right? So let's say we put it in a government um, agency. Name one government or federal agency that you deal with. Let's say the DMV, okay? So if you've ever been to the DMV, is there ever a day that you go in there and then you're um, next in line? No, I mean, no, there's always people. Yeah, you, you're, you're there for hours, right? Sometimes the whole day. So that's an example there. So there's a bottleneck. There's so many people needing the DMB services, but then there are only so many people, so many counters open. So that's the scenario here in Myasthenia Gravis. So the problem is we don't have enough receptor sites to receive the acetylcholine. So there's like a bottleneck here. So therefore, if there's not enough receptors, will the will the muscle contraction be sustained? Because only the the only way muscle contracts is for these um, acetylcholine, these neurotransmitters, to go from one neuron to the next neuron again. So between your uh, upper arm to your to your fingertips, there must be a continuous transmission of the signals. But will there be a continuous transmission if you don't have enough receptors here for your acetylcholine? Therefore, can you sustain a muscle contraction? No. No, not if you don't have enough of these receptor no. sites. So this is the problem in myasthenia gravis. So our body created antibodies against our own receptor sites, leading to um, muscle weakness, meaning the patient can start a muscle contraction, but the more they do it, the weaker the patient becomes because, again, there's not enough receptor sites to receive the acetylcholine. And the, uh, the natural um, sequence of events also, so let's say uh, in, in a normal person like you and me, we also need something to stop the acetylcholine. We also have uh, another enzyme called cholinesterase. Now, these are normal enzymes that will <clears throat> break down acetylcholine because otherwise, if there's no cholinesterase, then that means our muscles will never stop contracting. So we have to have something that will destroy acetylcholine so that we can stop muscle contraction. All right, so uh, again, let me summarize. So let's say I want to move my right arm. So dopamine helps me do that. I mean, I can control the movement. I can I can uh, do exactly you know how how high I can um, raise my arm, how long I'm gonna keep it raised. Uh, acetylcholine helps my muscles contract. Dopamine allows me to control that muscle movement. And then in order for me to stop contracting my muscle, moving my muscle, I need something to stop acetylcholine, which is now cholinesterase. So this is how muscle movement goes. Okay, so we have three, um, actually four. So we have four structures involved here. So we have cholinesterase to stop or break down acetylcholine. We need acetylcholine to 
make muscle contraction possible, dopamine to control that movement, and then we need these acetylcholine receptor sites to transmit um, the acetylcholine from one neuron to the next, allowing muscle to uh, contract. So what happens in myasthenia gravis is, again, the, the, the body creates antibodies against the receptor sites, destroying them. And therefore, as a result, we don't have enough, leading to the symptoms. So like I said, uh, the pattern of the weakness here starts from the head, from the eyes actually. So the most common symptoms early on will be drooping. So you'll have eyelid drooping and then you'll have also double vision. So all eye manifestations. And then and, uh, it goes down, so it will now affect your chewing muscles, your speaking muscles, uh, swallowing muscles until it, uh, it it reaches your diaphragm. Okay. So the pathophysiology here, this is what I explained. So the the problem here is the these antibodies here. So we have anti-acetylcholine receptor antibodies that destroy them, that, that destroy the receptor sites, leaving less in uh, to receive acetylcholine. Uh, of course, they have a much better illustration here than I did. Uh, another theory um, they've discovered is people with a tumor in the thymus gland may also have um, symptoms of the disease, meaning some in my some myasthenia gravis patients, they've discovered that there's a tumor in the thymus gland. Um, again, they don't really, um, it's not, as said here, it's not really clear, but um, they've discovered that if they remove that tumor, the patient's symptoms improve, um, but that's not really 100% either. Um, plus, it's only about 10% of the cases that have that. So let's go now to the manifestations. So the manifestations, again, it starts with the eyes, so you'll have drooping of your eyelids, you have double vision or blurred vision, and then it will uh, affect now your bulbar muscles. Again, these muscles are involved in chewing, speaking, swallowing, uh, or pretty much movement of your, of your jaw, all right? And then it will go down, the weakness again goes down to your upper arms and then your chest, and then reaching your fingers, your arms, and then the worst case will be it will involve your your breathing muscle, your diaphragm. Let's go to diagnosis. How do we diagnose myasthenia gravis? There's a test called hydrophonium. Uh, test or the common name for hydrophonium is tensilon. Now tensilon is a or hydrophonium is a um, short-acting anticholinesterase. Remember cholinesterase earlier in the whiteboard? So cholinesterase is a <clears throat> um, substance that will break down acetylcholine, right? It's a normally produced um, anticholinesterase in the by the body. <clears throat> so we will use the same, uh, the same type of drug, the same type of substance. However, hydrophonium is only a short-acting form of an anticholinesterase, meaning it's a safe drug to use in case you know it uh, because it does have some side effects. Anticholinesterase drugs could cause um, respiratory arrest, so we um, it's better to do the test with something short acting. OK, so we have a um, Again, the common name is Tensilon. So on the NCLEX exam or my exam, you will you will see Tensilon. But the drug used for Tensilon testing is a meaning the generic name for Tensilon is a 
All right, so there are two scenarios here. When we do the Tensilon test, so the patient, uh, I'll skip all this, okay, because this is um, just nice to know. It will just confuse you. So let's go to Tensilon testing. Okay, so I'm not doing the uh, EMG, repetitive nerve stimulation. Uh, I'm not doing that because uh, in the first place, we're not the ones doing that test, but the, the Tensilon, the nurse is uh, participating in this. So you are uh, involved in doing the Tensilon test. So this is what we will be on the exam. All right, there are two scenarios here. Um, if the patient has never been diagnosed yet, meaning the patient hasn't been taking medications, right? Are you with me? Let's say, um, let's say the patient is Jordana. Jordana's complaint was, I can't keep my eyes open. I keep, um, yeah, especially during the day, meaning the, the more I'm on the computer, the, the more droopy my eye gets, but I'm not sleepy. I'm just, I'm just, my eyes just can't keep, I just can't keep my eyes open. Plus my hands also, when I'm typing on the keyboard, I mean, I, I do fine early in the morning, but then as the morning goes on and the more I type, the, the weaker my hands get. I'm just so tired. I get so tired easily. And also when I'm walking, uh, I used to be able to walk from you know the office to the parking lot. I can hardly make it. I have to stop and then rest, and then I, I and then I can and I can go again. Same thing when I walk to the park. Okay, when I'm walking, I can't really walk a mile anymore. Sometimes it's only a few um, a few feet, and then I have to stop. I mean, I'm not short of breath. I'm just really tired. All right. So these are the patients' common um, complaints because the, the the pattern of myasthenia gravis is you get progressively weak with any repetitive motion. Meaning that the more you do something, a task, the the weaker the muscle gets. Um, give me examples of uh, activities you, you do repeated repetitively every day. Brush your teeth, take a shower. Okay, but brushing your teeth be one two minutes anyway so something you do constantly walk I okay exercise. okay what about um typing yeah that's repetitive right um chewing when you're eating a meal is that is chewing repetitive yes yeah because we have to take, uh, we, we have to chew food repetitively before we can swallow them, right? So these are the activities that are affected by myasthenia gravis. The more you repetitively do something, meaning the more a set of muscles contract repetitively, the weaker they become. Now, this could be dangerous, let's say, when you're eating. So you're eating, you're um, two minutes into the meal, right? So you're eating and then um you you notice that you're progressively getting weaker but you have to swallow but then by the time you swallow your swallowing muscles are not so weak they cannot let's say your epiglottis cannot close anymore so what could happen during swallowing fixation you could choke, right so there could be aspiration here so these are dangerous now uh, or let's say you are driving. So in the middle of, you know, some, let's say you're on a really busy highway when you're moving your legs from between the gas pedal and the, and the brake. What if the weakness occurs there? And then now all of a sudden when you need to step on the brake, you can't anymore because your leg is so weak, right? So these are the activities affected by myasthenia gravis. It's the repetitive movement of a set of muscles which can be, again, life-threatening, especially with when it comes to chewing. So uh, when we do the test, so so um, Jordana comes in to the doctor, tells, reports her symptoms, okay? like uh, from the eyes to her chewing, etc. 
So the doctor decides, OK, let's do a tensilon test. So the doctor will give 10 milligrams, up to 10 milligrams of hydrofonium. So again, this is an anticholinesterase agent, but it's a short acting one, which is safe to use. So it's given IV. Now, if the patient's weakness improves with hydrofonium, then it is a positive tensilon test. And the doctor makes a diagnosis of, yes, you have myasthenia gravis. Any question on the test? Repeat yourself, Professor, when it becomes okay. positive. All right. So, Jordana, you saw Jordana, right? You know about Jordana symptoms? Yeah. Okay. So, Jordana comes to the doctor, and then based on the symptoms, the doctor determines or suspects, oh, this could be myasthenia gravis. So, he sets up a tensilon test. So the doctor gives Jordana a shot IV push of hydrofonium. So let's say two milligrams and then goes on. So with, with the administration of hydrofonium, Jordana's symptoms improve, meaning uh, as you can stay, see here, if there is improvement of muscle weakness, two to five minutes followed by a return to baseline, meaning after two to five minutes, the weakness returns again, but it improved right after giving edifonium, meaning did she respond to edifonium? Oh, okay, get it. Yes, she responded to edifonium, but then after, because edifonium is short acting, it only lasts for two to five minutes. The patient therefore after the hydrofonium wears off, the weakness returns. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so therefore that's a positive tensilon test. So the doctor makes a diagnosis. Oh, Miss um, Mail, you, you have myasthenia gravis, okay? Because we have a positive tensilon test. Do you understand the test? Yeah? No. Yes, I got it. All right, so there's another scenario wherein tantalon testing is used. Now, the, the next scenario is, let's say, so we had Jordana diagnosed already. So now we, the doctor prescribed Jordana a longer-acting anticholinesterase drug, uh, which are mestinon, neostigmine, right here, peridostigmine, um, what's the other, or neostigmine, okay? So neostigmine and um, peridostigmine, but the uh, most commonly prescribed drug is peridostigmine, okay? So sh let's say Jordana is already on mestinon. Okay, so she takes it here. The instructions by the doctor is uh, take it, um, every four hours, okay, while awake. And the uh, instruction is, especially when before you do something, take the drug, okay? So, and then try, try to time your activities, whatever you're doing, um, time it at the peak of drug action, all right? So she's told to, um, here, take it 30 to 60 minutes before a meal, okay, so that you don't choke during a meal. Does, does that make sense? Yes. Hello? Okay. Yeah. This is something forever. Yeah. So so Jordana will have this condition forever. So in order for her to not to choke with every meal, she has to take mestinon or pyridostigmine 30 to 60 minutes before a meal. All right, and then that's for life. So she'll be taking pyridostigmine throughout the day. So, and then also when she has an uh, increase in activity, so let's say Jordana goes, uh, decides to do the Boston Marathon, right? So she does, she decides to join the, so she's now training for the marathon. Will she need less or more of my paradistic me? More. 
Whoever said more, yes, that's correct. So she will be having to take more of peridostigmine because she's now training for a marathon, right? So it'll be, she'll be taking it more frequently and the more she's using peridostigmine, so the more familiar she is with the drug. So she's now an expert on how to take it okay, and then how much to take. Or she, so she thought that she was um, taking enough but are we sure that she's taking too much or not enough of the drug? Would would we know? I mean, uh, will Jordana be 100% an expert on the doses of peridostigmine that she'll, she'll need to take every day? No. No, nobody will. All right. I mean, we, we can estimate, you know, about uh, every day, but however, however, if there are changes in our activity level, will it also require a higher dose? Mm -hmm. Yes. Or in uh, days when they let's say a weekend, we're in, we're doing less than we are during the week. Will we need more or less of the drug? We'll need less because we'll we need more. less. Professor, okay, okay, so I have a question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Now, what's that question? Oh, um, if you give too much, let's say like it's a day that uh that you're going to train, but you obviously you know that you need more. But let's say that you give too much. Like, what would happen? Like, would you start getting like muscle spasms and tachycardia and stuff like that? That's what I was trying to do. Okay, so that's what I'm trying to discuss next. Oh, All okay, right. So, so let's say throughout the life of Jordana. Will there be instances wherein she'll end up taking too much or not enough of the drug? Yeah. Yes. So this is something that Jordana will have to deal with now. In both instances, though, when she takes too much or not enough of the drug, unfortunately, the symptoms are similar. In both cases, the patient will have muscle weakness. So is it easy or difficult to tell whether I'm taking too much or not enough of the drug? Is it easy or difficult? Difficult. Uh, yeah. Another test? Yeah, so we can't we can't really tell right away. What am I experiencing? Am I experiencing uh, am I experiencing an overdose or am I experiencing a um a um uh, a not enough drug crisis. If well, it's called, yeah, if it's if it's caused by too much drug, we call it a cholinergic crisis. Mm -hmm. If we're if, if that's if we're taking too much of the drug, if Jordana end up ends up taking too much of the drug, she will experience a cholinergic crisis. If she ends up not taking enough of the drug, she will experience a myasthenic crisis. But again, the problem here is whether or not it's myasthenic or cholinergic crisis, the symptoms are very similar. The patient here, Jordana, will have weakness in either case. So therefore, we'll have to do a Tensilon test again. So there are two instances here wherein we do the Tensilon test. Mm -hmm. one, right. So one is if we are uh, diagnosing her for the first time, okay, which is no problem because she the, the 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 good thing about the Tensilon test is she's not on any anticholinesterase drugs yet. Okay, because she is she is still being diagnosed. Are you with me so far? Meaning, uh, let's just call the uh, initial uh, the the tensilon done for diagnostic purposes when she wasn't diagnosed yet. Uh, let's call it a diagnostic tensilon. All right. So in a diagnostic tensilon test, it's generally safe to do because the patient has weakness. And she's not on any drugs yet because we didn't know. Uh, and then when we gave her the edrophonium, which is a short-acting anticholinesterase, 
her what is the expected symptom again or, or response when she's when she has myasthenia gravis? All of the symptoms that come with myasthenia gravis would like temporarily go away while she's on it. Right. So her strength will improve if she has myasthenia gravis, right? So no problem. However, on the second scenario, so when we're using Tencelon now not to diagnose, but now to rule out um, cholinergic from myasthenia crisis, that can be dangerous now. So let's say uh, Jordana ends up not taking enough of the drug. Uh, so what type of crisis is that? Cholangiogenic. No, not enough. No, that would be the mice gravis. Okay, so she has a myasthenic crisis because Jordana didn't know yet. So she she didn't know. Oh, I, I didn't know I was supposed to take the drug more often when I'm when I'm increasing my activity. Okay, so she now she goes into a myasthenic crisis, but we don't know yet. So she goes to the doctor tells her symptoms and then the doctor decides okay let's do a um, um a tensilon test to rule out what type of crisis you're having whether it's myasthenic or cholinergic crisis if she's having a myasthenic crisis and we give edrophonium which is an anti-cholinesterase agent but a short acting one what is the expected response if she's having a myasthenic crisis which is not enough of the drug. So when you give edrophonium, what happens to her symptoms? Temporarily. It will temporarily go away. Very good. So she will have muscle strength improvement. All right. So she will improve. And therefore, we will find that the doctor will re realize that, oh, what you experienced was you were having a myasthenic crisis. Okay? You were not taking enough of the drug. Don't worry. So the doctor explains to her, you know, how much to take, blah, 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 and then gives her specific instructions. Okay, next time you, you take this much of the drug when you're doing a marathon, okay? All right. So what if the other problem is existing? So let's say Jordana en ended up taking too much of the drug. What kind of crisis is that? Cholinergic crisis. Cholinergic crisis. Because she's now taking too much. However, the symptoms will still be the same. She'll have weakness. Now, remember, if she's having a cholinergic crisis and then she goes to the doctor and then the doctor decides to do a Tensilon test. Again, remember, a reminder that she's already having high amounts of anticholinesterase drugs in her system. So when the doctor performs a Tensilon test during a cholinergic crisis, what will happen to Jordana? She gets even more anticholinesterase agents now. What will happen to her symptoms? It will worsen, get worse. All right, she will now get worse, not get better. Is this dangerous or is it still safe? It's dangerous because she can stop breathing. Now dangerous, right? Because now she could stop breathing. It the the weakness may now reach her diaphragm and she go into cardiac arrest. So during that test, whether we're uh, until we know that she's having a myasthenic crisis or a cholinergic crisis, every time therefore we do a tensilon test, we must have the antidote available. So atropine must be available when we're doing a tensilon test. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The patient, yeah. What will have, have um, caused Jordana to go into cardiac arrest are these symptoms right here. These side effects of bronchospasm, bradycardia, and diarrhea although diarrhea will not be life-threatening. But these are the, specifically bradycardia and bronchospasm will, what could possibly kill uh, Jordana if it is a cholinergic test. So therefore, if it is a cholinergic test and we, we perform the Tensilon test using edrophonium, we must have a atropine ready. 
So if it is cholinergic crisis and then she develops bradycardia or starts having difficulty breathing, then the doctor can administer atropine. Any question? All right. The other test is CAT scan. This will be in the case of, let's say, the patient is suspected to have the uh, tumor in the, of the thymus, thymus gland, the thymoma. Okay, so that's um, the, that's the only other test. But um, generally speaking, it's really the tensilon that we're relying on, the tensilon test. All right, so how do we manage the patient? So we kind of discussed, started already with this. So the patient is prescribed paradistigmine, and we already discussed how to take it. So especially before the activity, like uh, especially before a meal, because a meal is eating is a repetitive um, action, right? It involves repetitive muscle movement. So chewing is repetitive. So she needs to take uh, an anticholinesterase agent there. So what the, if you think about it, the anticholinesterase will therefore be the opposite of cholinesterase. So you remember we said earlier that in the whiteboard, wherein cholinesterase breaks down acetylcholine, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So therefore, if you take an acetyl, uh, an anticholinesterase, it will do the opposite. So it will not destroy acetylcholine. It will make acetylcholine available longer at the neuromuscular junction. So that even though you have less acetylcholine receptor sites, but then you have a lot of acetylcholine, so therefore it will compensate for the lack of um, receptor sites. Because now you have more acetylcholine and they're available longer at the neuro neuromuscular junction, so it will improve the, the muscle movement or muscle strength. Make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. So here are your other side effects of peridostigmine. So it does, bradycardia is always there. So what do you think is the teaching you will give the patient? Monitor what? Heart rate. Monitor your heart rate. Okay, very good. And here are your um, here's your drug chart, table 38.2. Um, I'll let you read that on your own. Again, the testable part is always the nursing considerations or nursing responsibilities about the drug. All right, so the patient will be on peridostigmine. They may be put on prednisone, especially if they're having increased symptoms. Um, low dose for mild and then high dose, obviously, for exacerbations because this is a autoimmune disorder. So if you're having these uh, flare-ups, then you'd be put on high-dose steroids. If it's only mild, then it'll be low-dose. Okay, in the case wherein the patient must have, must undergo surgery because peridostigmine is PO, um, when you're undergoing surgery, you're NPO and there is no IV form of peridostigmine, you'll have to be switched to neostigmine. So neostigmine is the only IV form of uh, anticholinesterase agents. All right, so if the patient is <clears throat> undergoing surgery, uh, we still need the anticholinesterase agents, right? But because Peridostigmine, again, is not available IV, so the patient will be switched to neostigmine. That makes sense? Yeah. All right. Uh, please read the rest here. I have a test question here. Uh, if you read this part here, all right, I won't read that for you. Other treatments are immunotherapy. As with any other autoimmune disorder, we use immunotherapy, we use, um, the patient will also be given immunosuppressants. Uh, so on top of prednisone, the patient will be on 
have we discussed these drugs yet? I think we did, right? For organ transplant? No. No. No? No. Uh, okay, maybe next semester. Anyway, so you have azathioprine, mycophenolate. These drugs are also the same drugs we use for organ rejection. Uh, you know, patients who receive organ transplants in order to suppress the immune system, to prevent it from rejecting the, the graft. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes or no? Can you repeat that, please? Okay. Um, do you know anything about uh, transplant, organ transplants? Yeah. Okay. So when, okay, so when you receive, let's say uh, you receive a kidney transplant, a very common example. So you, you, you lost your kidneys, you're on dialysis, and then you, you're on the transplant list. Then you receive a organ transplant. You, you receive a new kidney. Well, not new, but um, you know, a recycled kidney. Um, to prevent your body from rejecting the donated kidney, you, you, have to, you have to take immunosuppressants. So these are the immunosuppressants that you take as a thioprene, um, mycophenolate, and cyclophosphamide. Okay, these are um, examples of um, immunosuppressants. Okay, so these are used together with steroids to suppress your immune system because that is, again, the problem with myasthenia gravis. You have antibodies against your acetylcholine receptor sites. Okay, so therefore, to suppress your immune system, we need immunosuppressants. Make sense? Yes. All right. So please read the side effects, okay? Side effects for each one, if available, like this one, mycophenolate has these, diarrhea, anemia, leukopenia. Uh, same thing for uh, cyclophosphamide, since it's a chemo agent, so this drug will cause pancytopenia because it will uh, destroy your bone marrow. All right, so you'll have anemia, thrombocytopenia and neutropenia at the same time. Here are drugs to be used with caution when, give, when, uh, when given to patients with myasthenia gravis. So uh, these are just um, memorization, right? So calcium channel blockers, magnesium, certain antibiotics. Okay, so these are contraindicated in patients or at least given with caution in patients with myasthenia gravis. All right. Um, have you ever discussed apheresis? The course. You said, have you ever discussed what? Plasma apheresis. No. 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 Okay. All right. So let's discuss as plasma apheresis. Let's do uh, IBIG first because this is simple. All right, IVIG is immunoglobulin infusion. So this is given in most autoimmune conditions, including Guillain-Barre syndrome, for instance, um, so what IVIG does is this, right? We use these for, let's say you have, um, even in, in COVID-19, have you IBIG or specific? Okay. Professor, you're going in and out. It's breaking up. Professor, you're breaking up. Okay. So IBIG is um, immunoglobulin. So this is fast, good antibodies. Uh, any autoimmune disorder, you'll be given IV. Professor, I have difficulty guessing what you're saying. Yeah, Professor, you're breaking up. We can't hear you.
Can you hear me now? Hello? Yeah, we could hear you. All right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So in plasma freezes, uh, did, did you hear me uh, the part about immuno, immunoglobulin, IVIG? No. No, you was breaking up. The oh. Uh, you know what is in plasma, right? What does your plasma contain? Whole blood. Plasma and water. Plasma. Whole blood. Plasma. Water. Isn't it like um, mineral, like minerals and water and stuff? Okay, so don't say whole blood because whole blood has blood. Uh, plasma is the liquid portion of your blood. Are you with me so far? Yeah. Okay. So, um, IVIG is the good antibodies. So, this will be given from another, uh, this will be infused to the patient with myasthenia gravis uh, because you have auto antibodies, meaning you have bad antibodies that are destroying your acetylcholine receptor sites, so therefore the patient will receive IVIG donated from another person, so therefore it will therefore inactivate the auto antibodies and therefore suppresses the immune system. However, as stated here, it is very, very expensive. One treatment alone costs easily 10000 at least $10,000, a single infusion. However, since this is weight-based, look at the dosing. This is two grams per kilogram. And if let's say one gram is sold, I don't know, $1,500 per gram, and then you get your, your prescription is two grams, and then let's say the, the, the more you weigh, the more money you'll, you'll pay. Are you, do you understand this? Yeah. Okay, it's very effective though. IVIG is very effective, but very, very expensive. <clears throat> so you could easily spend twenty-five, forty thousand dollars $40,000. That's for one infusion though. And I don't know how much of that will be covered by your insurance. All right, so this is given, you, you don't get only one dose. This, this is given over three to five days. All right, so this very expensive it, uh, infusion. However, there is an alternative, so it's either that, it's either IVIG, or you can do plasmapheresis. Let's find plasmapheresis. Okay, plasmapheresis is described in chapter, I don't know what chapter this is, 20, chapter 20. So plasmapheresis is like dialysis. Only the difference here is we're not removing waste products. We're not removing excess electrolytes. Okay, we're not removing fluids. What we're removing is plasma. So it's a pheresis machine. The difference here again, uh, we, we, we need an IV access. So the patient here, since myasthenia gravis is a chronic condition, so therefore you will be given a shunt, just like in dialysis patients. So you, they'll create an AV fistula. Until then, though, until the AV fistula matures, then you'll need a catheter. So you'll have a big central line and then they'll put two needles in if you have a fistula. So one will remove the blood, 
put it into the machine and then while in the machine the 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 machine will remove plasma and then return the rest to you this is also called the plasma exchange plasma exchange is your blood your plasma is exchanged for either plasma from another donor or you're given uh, saline only because your body replaces plasma constantly anyway. So the difference between the two, if we are um, exchanging it for plasma, then we can remove more plasma. But if we're only replacing it with saline, then we can only remove less plasma. Does that make sense? So what's the purpose of a plasma exchange or plasmapheresis? Well, where are the antibodies found again? The ones causing your symptoms? Hello? Are you still with me, guys? Is it in the plasma? Yeah, what is in the plasma? Why are we doing a plasma exchange? The antibodies is causing the problem. All right, since all our antibodies are located in the plasma, so that's why this is another treatment option. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, yeah, of course, there are complications related to plasma because what else does your plasma contain? Is it only containing antibodies? No. No. What else are inside your plasma? Platelets. Cells, proteins. Well, not platelets, but clotting factors, right? Clotting mm -hmm. factors. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have clotting factors also in there. So there will be bleeding problems. Uh, plus, what's the majority? Component of plasma, Miss Yan. What is plasma mostly made of? Ninety-two percent water. Okay, it's mostly water, but what's holding the water in there? Sodium. Is protein? Albumin. Yeah, it's protein. Okay. So if you're removing, cons consider these consequences. Okay. So here it is. I'm back to page eight hundred five back to my senior gravis. So here is plasmapheresis now. Alright, so these are the complications for plasmapheresis in this paragraph right here. So I'm very slow because the network is very slow. Okay, you see this paragraph here? Page 805. Yes, we see this. Can you see this? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so these are your complications here for plasmapheresis. Uh, it can cause citrate-induced hypoglycemia because there's citrate in the machine, in the tubings when we remove your blood and put it in the machine. There is citrate in there, so it, it, it binds with your calcium, the, your free calcium, causing the formation of calcium citrate. So therefore, your free calcium here drops, causing hypoglycemia. There will also be... Uh, fluid um, shifts here because now your patient has is losing albumin here when you remove plasma and also um, no you lose you're losing albumin so therefore will you have hypertension or hypotension if you're losing you get hypotension okay there will be hypotension from hypovolemia mm -hmm. right so these are your pay your signs and symptoms and these are your interventions all right and another is nausea vomiting 
color, and then electrolyte imbalances. And that's it for plasma phoresis. Now let's go to surgical management now. Remember 10% of the cases have a thymoma. So if it discovered on the CAT scan that the patient has thymoma, they will undergo thymectomy. The thymus gland isn't a vital organ. I mean, it's just part of your immune system. It doesn't really, it's not really that significant, so it, you can get rid of it. Uh, for some patients who have this, they do have symptom improvement, but again, it's only a small portion of patients with uh, myasthenia gravis. Here are the two complications which we already described earlier, myasthenic crisis and cholinergic crisis. Uh, please read the differences on your own. Uh, but like I said, it may be difficult to distinguish which crisis it is because the patients will have similar features. And any question on the test again? What's the antidote again, if in case it's a cholinergic crisis? Atropine. All right, very good. Let's do the diet now. Because the patient have troubles chewing and swallowing, what will be the recommendation for these patients? Puree food, I guess. Um, they are risk for aspiration. Okay, so um, there will be modification of their diet. Now, as far as breathing is concerned, if the patient has respiratory weakness, as stated here, so patient's vital capacity will have to be measured. Um, vital capacity is measured by a spirometer, and um, that's a doctor's problem. Okay, we, we really don't have that responsibility. However, here's a safety alert. <clears throat> because this is not a gas exchange problem, the patient's lungs are normal here. What really causes the patient's respiratory problems is the diaphragm. Mm -hmm. or the diaphragm is a muscle, so can it be affected by myasthenia gravis? Yes, because the main yes. muscle for respiratory inspiration. Yeah. Okay. So therefore, monitor the vital capacity. Okay, not the pulse ox. Why not the pulse ox? What did I say earlier? What's the problem here? Is it a lung problem or a diaphragm problem? No, it's a diaphragm problem. Hey, okay, it's a muscle. It's a breathing muscle problem. It's, it's not. Muscle, yeah. There's nothing wrong with the patient's lungs. They're, they're, the gas exchange is fine. It's really the ventilation part that's the problem. All right. And please read the nursing care on your own as well as nursing interventions. Okay, let me proceed now to rheumatoid arthritis. Go to page 344. All right, rheumatoid arthritis is another autoimmune disorder. This one is involving connective tissues, um, but this is not systemic though. The, um, the disease is chronic systemic autoimmune inflammatory disease. This, the, the symptoms mainly involve joints. 
um, the 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 pattern though is always bilateral, meaning it's it occurs in a symmetrical fashion. So it will involve both wrists, both ankles, both knees. Now this is different from osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is not inflammatory. I mean, it's not autoimmune. Osteoarthritis is more of a wear and tear problem, meaning people who use their body so much for work, let's say nurses, for instance, we're, we're abusing our bodies, we're always on our feet. So that's a lot of pressure and wear on our large joints that our weight bearing joints because we're always on our feet. Uh, we have these repetitive motions. Uh, sometimes we don't follow good body mechanics. So um, mostly nurses will eventually develop osteoarthritis. Okay, so that's a disease of uh, wear and tear on the joints, meaning degenerative joint disease. Not so for rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis is autoimmune. It can affect all ages. You can have Rheumatoid arthritis as early as now, you're in your early 20s, you, you can have um, rheumatoid arthritis as, as early as your age. So it's not really true that it only affects old people. Okay, Most people though who have rheumatoid arthritis are old, but, um, me, but that doesn't mean they just develop rheumatoid arthritis when they got old. It only means that they, 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 they still grow old, but they, they probably suffered from the disease earlier on. Any question about the pattern? All right, let's go to signs and symptoms now. So most patients' complaints will be pain and joint stiffness. So the patient may have swelling of the joint, so this will involve any joint, either in your hands or your knees, your ankles, for instance, but mostly um, in, the, in the hands that we use a lot. I mean, in the joints that we use a lot. So namely our knees and also our, uh, our, our hands. If untreated, as stated here, if left untreated, it will cause irreversible joint damage and disability. Look at the picture here. Now, Vivian, if your joints in your hands are already like this, how can you open the doorknob? Or let's say, Miss Davian, how are you going to do the paperwork now when you do number two? You can't. How can you close the buttons on your shirt, Miss Decker? Um, with the help of someone else. I'm sorry, Professor. My <laughs> That's yeah. fine. Um, but you don't have rheumatoid arthritis, right? Not yet. Okay, that's good. Um, or let's say, Miss Miss Yan, uh, how can you prepare food or use your laptop if your hands are already like this? Use the speech to text function. Okay. okay, very good. I admire your resource resourcefulness. All right, so you understand why we need to treat rheumatoid arthritis. So it's not true that oh my joints are not that bad yet. Okay, let's say you're diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. You can say, oh, it's still early on. Earlier on, I mean, I don't need to, the treatment because the treatment here will be similar to the immunosuppressants we use for myasthenia gravis patient or any other autoimmune disorder like lupus, for instance, multiple sclerosis, all these autoimmune disorders have the same treatment. These patients will be taking immunosuppressants, which you already saw some of the side effects. They're not pleasant either. You're at risk for infection. You have these <coughs> edema. <coughs> you have these unpleasant uh, side effects, okay, in, including blood disorders resulting from the as a side effect of the drugs. However, if you don't do treatment though, this is what the disease will do to your joints. And once they're already occurring, the damage done, you, it cannot be reversed anymore. 
So the treatment really here is to prevent joint joint uh, deformity here as for as long as possible. So this is the uh, the goal of treatment is to prevent this from happening later on. So you can't really say, oh, I'll take it later when, when I have these. No, it's not like that. It doesn't work like that. The immunosuppressants cannot reverse these joint deformities and joint damage. Okay, it's exactly the reason why we take the immunosuppressants to prevent the antibodies from destroying your joints, causing these dis deformities. That makes sense? So these are the uh, differences between osteo and rheumatoid arthritis. Like I said, osteo is not uh, autoimmune. This is more wear and tear. So that's that's why it, it doesn't have the same pattern as rheumatoid arthritis. In rheumatoid arthritis, what is the pattern again? Is it possible to have only one joint involved, like only my right wrist and not the left? With osteo, yes, but not with rheumatoid. Okay, so in rheumatoid arthritis, the pattern is always symmetrical. Okay, it's symmetrical bilateral. However, in osteo, it can only be, let's say, one knee. So let's say your left knee is totally starting to hurt. So you will kind of favor the right knee, right, over the left. So maybe you'll put more um, pressure now on the right instead of the left, and then that will cause another problem. So again, the symmetrical joint involvement only is seen in rheumatoid arthritis. I'm not saying osteo won't affect both joints. They will, they can, but not typically. Okay, it's all usually unilateral here. Unless you abuse both joints, then you'll have symmetrical. And there is no systemic organ involvement here because this one again is wear and tear on the joints. This one is more autoimmune, affecting mostly connective tissues. Okay, so you have connective tissues not only in the joint, but also elsewhere. So it can get um, rheumatoid arthritis. You can get uh, arthritis of the lung also, because the lung has uh, connective tissue, and then uh, elsewhere in your body. Lab tests, there is no, this one here. Lab test alone is not enough because there is really no specific drug test to diagnose rheumatoid arthritis. This is all done clinically. So the doctor has a tough job of uh, making a diagnosis because inflammatory markers like ESR, CRP, or even ANA, anti-nuclear antibody, uh, or the rheumatoid factor also, this one, rheumatoid factor. It's not exclusive to rheumatoid arthritis, meaning other autoimmune disorders like lupus, for instance, or multiple sclerosis or systemic sclerosis. Those um, conditions, which are also autoimmune disorders, also have positive ANA antibodies, positive for RA factor. Um, and also high CRP, high, high ESR. So it's not, it's difficult to rule out, okay, just because you're positive, oh, you have a rheumatoid arthritis or you, or you have CRP. It, it's really difficult. Okay? So it, the doctor has to do all the, um, combine all your symptoms, all your complaints um, with clinical examination of your joints plus all these lab works here. Okay, but again, that's not our concern. That's the problem. That's the problem of the doctor. So our problem here is in the treatment now. So how do we care for patients with rheumatoid arthritis? So let's start with non-drugs first. So most of the questions on the exam will be <clears throat> uh, more on the drugs. Of course, you'll also have non-pharmacologic. So the exercise here, the goal is to maintain joint movement and joint function. So our um, recommendations are range of motion exercises. Um, and these are the rationale for that. PTOT will help <clears throat> to maintain joint function for as long as possible. Um, and then we'll do some therapies which are found under the nursing interventions. For drugs, as I said earlier, these patients will be given 
immunosuppressive agents. But first, the patient's complaint is pain, so these patients will have to be taking NSAIDs. NSAIDs are the most effective because this is inflammatory in nature, so um, opioids will not work very well. It's not really beneficial for them to take opioids because opioids do not target inflammation, but at least NSAIDs do. So NSAIDs relieve pain by relieving inflammation. So that's why they're more effective for the pain in, in rheumatoid arthritis. However, there are consequences for taking NSAIDs for a long time because this is one of the causes of peptic ulcers. So we'll discuss another drug to protect the patient another time. Steroids are used either by mouth, IM, injected directly into the joint, or even IV. However, steroids are not cell-specific, therefore it will suppress the patient's entire immune response. So therefore, it's like a, a shotgun compared to a, a sniper rifle. Um, so glucocorticoids target everything. So they have more systemic infections compared to um, DMARDs. So DMARDs are disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. So these drugs are, um, however, they're not specific to rheumatoid arthritis also. Uh, you'll see these drugs again and again with any autoimmune disorders. For instance, methotrexate is also used in lupus, um, also in systemic sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis also benefit from methotrexate. Methotrexate is available or in by injection. Here is famous, right? You've heard this on TV. Uh, this is only used for lupus and also in uh, rheumatoid patients. But you're aware of the cardiac risk for this disease, also having eye problems with, uh, related to hydroxychloroquine. You have sulfasalazine and tofacitinib. Uh, but the most common are these that I highlighted. Uh, definitely, you'll have a question on methotrexate and hydroxychloroquine or Plaquenil. We will not test biologics because they remain out of reach because they are very expensive drugs. So I, I have no questions on the biologic response modifiers because they're really <clears throat> uh, not all people can afford them. All right, so here's methotrexate because this is the cheapest and most people are on methotrexate, uh, again, by mouth or by injection. So it's hepatotoxic. Um, here's folic acid supplementation while you're on it. No alcohol. Uh, again, because it's hepatotoxic, um, it will inactivate your OCPs or oral contraceptive um, pills. Therefore, uh, you should use something else because otherwise, if you get pregnant and you're on methotrexate, you'll your baby will look really weird. Um, with renal insufficiency, I mean, this is a given. This is not specific to methotrexate. Feel free to interrupt me anytime, okay? So again, these are the... Um, I have no questions on these tables. The, the questions will be on this part right here okay. and also this safety alert 19.3 uh, 19.4 i have no questions for those uh, surgery the patient may benefit from the surgery but remember this if the patient gets a joint replacement so yeah it will be beneficial however that means you'll have to replace all the joints though and that's a lot of joint to replace so um, thank you for reading this part, Ms. Corbin. Surgical interventions including joint replacement or fusion may be necessary to help alleviate pain, but it may not actually improve function. 
patients may choose to have surgical removal of rheumatoid nodules, but they may return over time. All right. So is based on this one, is surgery really an option or uh, even a treatment or a cure for rheumatoid arthritis? No. Not really. For oh, What about for osteoarthritis? Yeah, it should be with osteoarthritis. Yes. Okay, so surgery, joint replacement is more beneficial for osteoarthritis, not for rheumatoid arthritis. In osteo, it is actually a cure because you now you have a titanium joint. It's brand new, um, so you're you're better than a human person, but not so for um, rheumatoid arthritis because this one is autoimmune in in nature. Uh, professor. Uh, yes. If you have a joint replacement, like for OA, would that affect um, MRI? Like, um, not really, no. Okay, so none of them are attracted by the magnet. Um, I would defer to your doctor for that one, uh, but generally speaking, no, because okay. these these are not steel per se. Thank you. Okay. All right, here's a summary of your um, signs and symptoms. And they do have improvement with um, NSAIDs for pain. But again, the as far as what is this diagnostic tests are concerned, there's really nothing specific as already stated here. Um, and here are your interventions. So non-pharmacologic again, range of motion. You can do also heat applications that will also help. Um, fault precautions is implied here, although not specifically mentioned in your textbook. Um, again, the part of your interventions and management will be related to the side effects of the medication. All right because they would involve mostly immunosuppressants. And then you have a big safety alert there for methotrexate because uh, almost all people will be on methotrexate because it's the most cost effective treatment. Because they're taking immunosuppressants, so therefore they're all at risk for infections. Any question on rheumatoid arthritis? Professor, do we have to know um, 19.20 box? 19. What page is that? 346. Table? 19.2. Oh, 19.2. Um, yes, because it's on your blueprint. There's a um, okay. line there or row there that says uh, compare osteo from rheumatoid arthritis. So, yes. Okay, I didn't see the blueprint yet. Any questions? All right, so I'll see everybody next week for your presentations. Um, please make sure so you. So, Professor, the quiz first. The quiz was then the presentation.